I think this is the first time that we've had somebody as a guest who's actually listened to the show in advance. I confess, I confess. <laughs> as long as you don't call us out and say, no, wait a second, you were meant to do the ad two minutes ago. What's going on? Oh, please do that. That'd be very funny. Uh, Welcome, man. listener. This is fantastic. Hi, yes. great to be here. Ah. Uh, this is um, Melody Coleman Chardonnay joining us uh, from bright and sunny Tel Aviv, as you can see from the glare behind her, um, for a wonderful interview episode of Science Actually Presents the Nerd and the Scientist. In addition to the lovely Melody, it is myself, Cobby Rose, and Benjamin Salas here joining you today. How's it going, guys? I'm great. How are you doing, Melody? Forget you, Cobby. How are you doing, Melody? <laughs> <laughs> I'm great. It's morning, so I need my coffee, but it's great. Yes, thank you again for for agreeing to join us at this time that works between our three time zones, um, which I I think are probably like as inconvenient as possible for any three time zones for a meeting between Tel Aviv, uh, California, and the east coast of Australia. Um, but also considering the fact that you're probably jet lagged as anything, given the fact that you were also in the US until just recently, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, that's true. But it's the only time I get to see you. So, you know, I would wake up for that. No, don't tell the audience. They'll, f they'll figure out my ruse of basically making all of the interview guests friends who I need an excuse to catch up with. Oh, that's how it works. Okay. Okay. All right. I get some friends of mine. Be on the show, but they all, you know, make cartoons, and they don't know much about space. <laughs> if any of them make space for cartoons, that could work. Um, but yes, Melody and I now now that you've ruined it, uh, Melody and I are great friends. Uh, we've known each other for close to a decade. Is that wow. right? Oh wow, really? I don't know. <sighs> 2015? Yeah, that's that makes sense. Yeah. Wow, time oh is crazy. Um, yeah, I I first met Melody when I was a, a mentor in the, the Ramon Foundation. Um, we were both teaching there together. Um, but rather than me giving your intro, I would love it, Melody, if you could uh, tell our listeners slash viewers a little bit about yourself, um, you. what you do how you spend your days and uh and what your connection is to space this wonderful massive endless void that we're also obsessed with on this show at the moment i'm the executive director of israel space forum which is a new organization a non-profit organization um, trying to gather all the industry or the space ecosystem in israel um, in my vision it's going to be something similar to NL Space in the Netherlands or the SIAA in Australia, for example. Um, but at the moment, we are very, very new. Uh, so we, we're mostly learning about the ecosystem, what are the barriers, what are the gaps, and how we can support the ecosystem in Israel. But how did I get here? This is more interesting. So how, how long yeah, tell us about that. to go back? But a couple of days ago, I was... Um, Eitan, the Israeli astronaut, was interviewing me, actually. Um, and he asked me, what first got me into the space industry? Do you guys want to, to hear the full story? Yes. Yes, full absolutely. Story. Okay, I'll give you the short version because how my mom was in love with MacGyver is a bit too uh, stretch, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but basically, I grew up um, watching the Stargate TV show, Stargate SG-1, and I wanted to be Major Samantha Carter more than anything in the world. That woman is amazing, amazing. So that's what I wanted to grow up. This is what guided me through life. And I think the most funny thing happened when I joined the International Space University. You always have to present yourself and how you get there. So I started my story with the Stargate and Samantha Carter. And then I think it was like 12 other um, women over there just raised their hand and said, hey, I'm here also because of Stargate and Samantha Car Car Carter. Wow. Um, <laughs> which is crazy. Um, I have a really good friend and 
I think it was two years ago, we met spontaneously in, in London and we actually get a, got a tattoo to, to symbolize that because she also got into the space industry because of Sergei. Um, so I like it as an example of how popular culture uh, can affect and inspire people go into STEAM education and, and the pursuit of space. Absolutely. I'm sure you also have yeah. stories, right? Why are you in the space industry? <laughs> I mean, I think, I think for me, it's, it's like, I just fell in love with the romantic side of, uh, of being able to explore the universe and understand that this world that we're in. Um, and I guess I was very fortunate that there were a lot of, uh, role models who I could relate to, um, you know, people, people like Carl Sagan, who are both, um, pioneers of outreach and science communication, as well as active, uh, researchers in, in astrophysics, like what I'm doing. Um, but yeah, I think, I think the, the thing that hits most strongly in, in your story is just how important representation is, um, you know, for, for young women to be able to, to, to all agree, oh, this was the only person that we could all look up to as somebody who was just like a badass space person in media. Um, it's both really cool and, and really almost, almost like a bit of a shame that there isn't more of a diversity of, of characters that you could, um, you know, use to motivate you. But wow, yeah, I love that. <laughs> Benjamin, what's your story? I never watched Stargate's TV show. You can still do. I know I can still do it. Uh, well, I'll, I'll get to it. Uh, what started me off on the space stuff is uh, it was my dad. It's 100% my dad's fault. He got me watching the Carl Sagan Cosmos uh, show when it came on. Um, he got me watching movies like The Right Stuff uh, about the first astronauts and breaking the sound barrier and everything. My dad is always has been and still is obsessed with flight and airplanes. Um, he was a paratrooper when he was in the army. As he told me, he wasn't smart enough to fly the airplane, but he was dumb enough to jump out. And so <laughs> all our conversation has been growing up was uh, about space and about flight. And it stuck with me my whole life. And I, I love it. It's my That's dad's great. fault. You're here because of my dad. <laughs> Yeah, my my parents had made the comment after I did. Um, I went skydiving for the first time, uh, not just you know being being stupid enough to jump out of a plane, but being stupid enough to jump out of a perfectly good plane. <laughs> there was nothing wrong with. <laughs> Kobe, please tell me that you also have a NASA, a NASA mug in your hand, so we can feel together. I I had oh no, I had an MIT Radio Stars mug. And I was rushing over here to get to the room that I'm recording in, and I left it there. And it's also filled with delicious coffee. Um, so it doesn't yeah. matter. We asked for a NASA mug, so MIT mm -hmm. doesn't cut it. She was very specific. <sighs> I, I mean, the, the best I can do is my science actually keychain. Oh, does that, it's cute. Does that do something? <laughs> Mine got lost in the mail. I'm sorry. I'm sure you shipped it already. I will yeah. absolutely ship it. <laughs> okay, so, so I love I love the the like kind of initial inspiration, but um, I'm curious. Like, you know, people people often talk about you know I want to go into space. What are the things that I need to do? And I think that's kind of such a misleading. Um, question because at the end of the day there's no one way to become an astronaut there's no one way to work in the space industry there are different versions many different versions of astronauts and of people who work in the space industry um you know everything from from mission scientists on the astronaut front to space historians that's a thing yeah. so um I, I i love hearing stories about different people's paths so okay, you've, you've, you know, you've gotten to university, you decided to study engineering, right? And science. I did a double bachelor degree. I also you did... have scientific background. I'm proud of my <laughs> geologic and atmospheric science background, as well as the mechanical engineering. We are very <laughs> impressed with it as well. Well done. <laughs> no, 
So you've got a double degree, engineering and science, even though it's geology, but okay, sure. Um, <laughs> oh, 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 Jim Green will disagree children. with you. He's the former chief children. scientist of uh, NASA. He supported me. <laughs> I don't want to offend Jim Green. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Okay, and so and so then after that, you've basically, as from my perspective, mm -hmm. like as as one of your friends, I've just seen it being like you're just you're just kicking ass and taking names. You're just like doing all of the space stuff, and I, I was wondering if you could like frame that for the audience. So like talk a bit about the the different work that you've done in addition to your studies. Okay. Uh, I think the most important thing to remember is that I'm usually just having fun, okay? It all so sounds very serious, but space is so cool. So I think in every job I got, I just had the best time. Um, so during my university studies, I started to work as a student work at, at the Ramon Foundation, um, mentoring kids on space exploration and we called it like getting the 21st skills uh, century skills but basically teaching kids how to think because today i think it, in most most of the countries the education system are not good enough in that way of teaching them how to think and how to to criticize things and came up, coming up with their own idea Mm -hmm. So what Kobe and I did is try to inspire those kids into this kind of thinking and to design an experiment to send to the ISS, the International Space Station, which is one of the most incredible things you can give to kids. That's awesome. Yeah. And did you actually create an experiment that sent to space and actually went? So I have, I'm, I'm really happy to share that two of my classes won the competition and actually uh, <laughs> sent experiments. She has, to, she has to rub it in my face. My, my Ooh, students who were brilliant. Like Kavi didn't win something that My you students didn't. were incredible. At both of the schools I taught at, my students were absolutely brilliant. Um, and unfortunately, we weren't selected to send our missions that, those years that I was a uh, mentor in that program. Not but to say that Melody me. students are less brilliant. But. No, no, no. You had only two classes. I had like 10 or 20. So I had more options. Hey, you played the numbers game. Yep, I get it. Numbers. It makes sense. <laughs> I mean, beat me to it. Yes. Play the uh, but game. I think the important thing <laughs> is not the winning, actually. So it's right. It's good. not the winning. It's getting it's something that you created to go to space <laughs> is not exciting at all. It's all about friendship. <laughs> it's all about friendship. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. The, the real space mission was the friends we made along the way. <laughs> All right, Kavi can't answer this question, but Melody can. What did you get sent to space? Oh, so it's not get me. It? I have Kavi to got emphasize sent to space. It's not me. I have to emphasize that. So my kids did all the job. Kobe, I think this is one of the best part in, in the Ramon Foundation. Whenever the kids are coming to us with a question, what what is our answer? Do you want to say that? I'll leave it to you. Okay. It's like, let's Google it. Go and find the answer. Like, they're asking us, we don't have the answers. Let's find them together. Because the entire program is based on um, this mythology of um, project-based learning, basically. It's not a regular teaching. Um, Anyway, where were we? <laughs> what, Benjamin what wanted to know, uh, yeah, what, what, was what did the kids send to space? Well, let's see if I remember. One experiment was about um, stem cells and one uh, about the nerve systems. They basically wanted to, to challenge some of the theory, the theory that are currently, um, I don't know, possessed about human in space or health care mm -hmm. in space. They wanted to support astronauts. Um, but and this is why. Wanted, wh why? So basically, Sorry. they wanted yeah. to improve humankind in space. Um, but the unique thing is that they both of the, the classes uh, search for different labs uh, in Tel Aviv University or Ichilov Hospital, and they collaborated with, with 
really amazing professors that just donated their time and their lab equipment and supported this kid, these kids. Um, and that's quite fantastic. It's so cool. And like you were saying, this, this whole idea of basically our role um, with the students being to facilitate their learning through this project-based learning system, right? Because, you know, me with a physics degree and you, even with a double degree in uh, atmospheric and, uh, and geology, as well as mechanical engineering, like we, neither of us know anything about stem cells um, or, or nerve cells. And, you know, we need to help them learn how to learn, which I think in the 21st century is the best and most important skill that anyone can have, right? It's not like this old style schooling system where it's like, oh, what are the things that I need to know? Cool. Teach me these things. No, there's, there are too many things to learn. <laughs> we cannot learn them all. And also we mentioned before about how space or the space ecosystem is involving space historian. And one of my best friends is an anthropo anthropologist space anthropologist but also in in those lessons i think we put a lot of emphasis about how kids that don't especially like science can also be a part of that project they can create a design posture to support the project they create a, a pr campaign in their school get them involved in space activity even though they don't like science or they think they don't like science because what do you really know when you are 14 years old about what you like and don't like. It's a good point. It's a good point. <laughs> so we're trying to bring them to, to be inspired and interested in, in new things, new topics. I loved it. I loved it. How I, do they I... get the, exper the experiment for the, the nerve cells and the stem cells? How mm -hmm. do they get it up to space? To space? So basically, this, the Mamon Foundation is an amazing organization. It's a nonprofit organization here, here in Israel that um, was established by the, le the late Mona Ramon, the widower of Ilan Ramon, the Israeli astronaut who died in the Columbia accident in 2003. Um, after she lost her first um, son, Asaf Ramon, as well, um, she established this foundation, trying to inspire kids all around the country to follow the footsteps of Asaf and Ilan. And the Ramon Foundation, specifically in this program, it's called the Space Lab program for um, middle school kids. They worked with NanoX, now called Voyager. Um, NanoX has this platform, the Mixtix. It's a simple tube that you can do some basic manipulation on it, like shake it, open a barrier or a clamp. Um, so basically, the Ramon Foundation is launching these experiments with NanoX to the ISS, and then astronauts performing the or conducting the experiment, and the results are going back to to Earth, and then the labs are going to analyze all the results. That's awesome. There's, like you there's said, a couple of assignment to an then, astronaut in space, and they yeah. grade it when it comes back. <laughs> Fantastic. There's also a couple of uh, like. Um, academic publication that made out of these experiments. So how often you can see a nine years, nine grader being named in a public in a publication. I mean, that's awesome. Yeah. I mean, there are there are PhD students in, in my building who have still not, you know, published a paper. Uh, mm -hmm. Publishing a paper is hard. It, it really, you know, it takes a lot of work to have a significant contribution to a paper. So yeah, it's it's incredible. Um, and I really am so grateful that I got to to you know work with you and, and the rest of the folks at the Ramon Foundation. Um, speaking of rocket launches, I might take a quick break, uh, just for a brief ad before we continue on to our next segment. So, Benjamin, are you tired of boring vacations? Am I ever? Well, you should get ready to leave the planet without leaving a mess. Introducing EcoSpace, the first space travel company that's 100% green. Our rockets are made entirely from recycled materials. Old soda cans? Check. Grandma's old lawn chair? Check. You bet. That stack of unsold encyclopedias has been sitting in your basement for three weeks? Oh, yeah. Blast off to the stars in a ship that's basically a flying recycling bin. And save the, the Earth while you leave it. 
<laughs> Book your journey with Ecospace today because who says you can't save the planet while you explore the galaxy? Ecospace, saving the Earth, one recycled rocket at a time. <laughs> Sign me up. I like the part of the encyclopedia is left unused for three weeks. All encyclopedias are unused for three weeks. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> at least three weeks, if not three years. <laughs> Gosh, those Encyclopedia Britannicas that are just sitting in my parents' basement, just like gathering dust to the point where their outer covers have changed colors. Ooh. Okay, I have to Wonderful. ask you a question. How did you yes. come up with the idea of the ads? Like, ah, this is a good question. So know, we use <laughs> always good questions from Melody. Um, so what we do for our ads is we come up with ideas and then we get ChatGPT to write the ads for us. And if the ads don't align with our vision, we recreate them and we yell at ChatGPT and say, no, make it funnier. No, make it shorter. No, do this, do that. And then, uh, yeah, that's that's basically it. I'd and then sometimes I'll... ChatGPT to give me like a, a carnival barker trying to sell me something and i've said make it 75 percent funny 25 percent serious and if you change those values it actually ups or downs the the comedy bits in it it's hysterical <laughs> it can actually change this the humor is one of, of the best uses of chat gpt i've heard for real it's <laughs> great it is good and it, i have to say it anywhere else is okay gives, <laughs> as long as you know that it's just to give you a good start to go somewhere else and research the finer points like for real but to make a you know an awesome ad about eco space where you have rockets made out of garbage <laughs> uh, it's perfect it's absolutely perfect it's flawless oh gosh <laughs> speaking of uh, speaking of sending things to space uh and and rocket launches um so melody you were I, I want to say fortunate enough, but maybe considering how tirelessly you worked on this, um, it's not fortunate. But like you worked your butt off on the uh, Axiom One mission, right? Basically yeah. managing the schedule for for Israeli astronaut Eitan Stieber. Um, how how did you how did that even happen? And then what was what was that experience like for you? How did you meet him and befriend him? <laughs> And then get to be his manager as he went to space. <laughs> just, I'm picturing just Melody like hiding behind the trash cans outside of his house, just like waiting for him to go out for his morning job. Just like the moment he does, he's like, "Hey, Adrian, over here." <laughs> Watch that be actually the <laughs> way. It's just being in the right place in the right time, I guess. And and it was because of the Ramon Foundation. So I was in the working in the Ramon Foundation. I was just up, finishing my my bachelor degrees, just completing the, I think it was the first uh, course I ever took with the International Space University, and then Aiden decided he's gonna go to space, and and I'm putting like in in a very shallow way, but he came to the Ramon Foundation and basically said, hey, I'm going to space. I'm gonna donate all of my time, all of my effort, all of my resources to this mission to you. Basically, he gave the Ramon Foundation the opportunity to manage a human spaceflight mission. And that's huge because up until then, human spaceflight in Israel always um, were in, like around tragedy about the Columbia accident. And now we got the opportunity to change the narrative to to talk about a successful human spaceflight mission in Israel. So what we did at the Ramon Foundation, and I think this is also one of the brilliant things that we ever did, was we came to the conclusion that we cannot do it alone. And that mission should be belong to everyone in Israel. So even the name of the mission was not chosen by us. The, the name of the astronaut, the Israeli astronaut mission on AX1 was named Rakia. Rakia mission. Rakia is from the Bible. It means permanent, where, where God separated the water above from the water below. The water above is Rakia in Hebrew, basically. It means the sky or above the sky. And it was chosen by 
by the public in Israel. It wasn't chosen by us. So similar to how we gave the public the opportunity to choose the name, we issued call for proposals in um, science and technology sector, education, and also art and humanities. And that give it, it gave everyone the opportunity to submit their idea for activity in space. So kids and youth movement and professors from the universities and startup companies and artists and a teacher from a remote, um, I don't know, periphery, a visa, everyone could pitch in and gave an idea. And then we had a selection committee. Um, like we, we, t- we took everyone from the main university, like huge professors from the main universities in Israel and people from art institutions. And we had this selection committee that basically just wanted to make sure everything the public pitch was feasible to conduct on the ISS. Because if someone is asking, I don't know, let's try to light a candle in space, I can say in advance, no, we cannot do it in, on board the ISS. NASA will not allow us. Um, and I think around eight months after we started this process, Eitan went to Houston to start his training with an astronaut. He had to train both in SpaceX in California and also in, in JSC in Houston, Texas. And I just came back to Israel from a summer with the International Space University. It was in Spain. And Eitan gave me a phone call like, uh, Melody, can you come for a week? just to try and organize all the experiments because we had some problem with integration of the experiments. We, we had more than, we tried, I think in the beginning, more than 45 experiments to, to implement in his mission. So I packed up a suitcase for one week, went to Houston and ended up staying for eight or nine months over there and basically becoming the flight operation manager of the mission. I was in charge of integrating all the scientific experiments, all the education lessons and activities and art. And let me say that sending artwork to space can be more difficult than sending experiments to space. First of all, you need to convince NASA that this is a reasonable thing to ask, because why would you do that in space? Why do you want to do art in space? And then we have to explain them that for us, it's important because we want to bring more people into the space ecosystem, not the regular audience of science and, and engineer. We want to bring also artists and then trying to explain them what is this art all about. I mean, it was sometimes it was very, very difficult. <laughs> very. Um, I got to manage his entire training schedule because he had the training with NASA and SpaceX, but we also, because we had only one shot, I mean, he, he went to space for two weeks and, and that's it. I don't know when will be the next astronaut from Israel. So we wanted to train him on each and every one of the payloads. That's quite unique because usually um, the agency's astronauts, they are going to space for six months for the ISS and everyone just give them the experiment. They are trained on the facilities, not on the experiment itself. But because we had only one shot, we really want him to succeed. Also, everything you're doing in, sp- in space is take longer than doing it on Earth. So let's say, for example, Eitan need to record himself doing a teaching lessons about geography from space or about surface tension. On Earth, it will take him, let's say, 10 minutes. In space, it will take him much longer just to bring the object to the camera and make sure he's not floating away and you can still hear him talking to the camera. I mean, everything is taking longer, so we wanted to to train him well. Um, And of course, after he launched and and made it successfully to the ISS, I, I had the privilege of sitting during his mission in Axiom Mission Control Center. Um and managing his his entire mission. And that was incredible for me. I think it was the best part. I always say that Ethan had the most fun, but I was the second afterward. (laughs) Oh my gosh. I'm so glad to hear you speak about it in that way, because from your description, like managing that schedule and the training and all of the intergovernmental and departmental 
um, bureaucracy to get all these different missions approved and all this training. Uh, as you said at the beginning of the call, like uh, you've still managed to have fun and and enjoy it throughout, and I, and that's that's really cool. It's really awesome. Yeah. Was it hard for Axiom to get permission to go to ISS? No, I think so. We started to work with Axiom after the after they already um, well, they won the, the NASA call for PAM mission, private astronaut mission. And I think we were lucky enough that we were first because we had the, we could try things that are now might be a bit questionable. Um, for example, Aidan Aidan <laughs> conducted thirty four different experiments on one mission more than 60 um, educational activity, 15 artwork. His schedule was crazy. Now, I, I when I built the schedule, I, I consulted with some astronauts, like NASA's astronaut, and they all looked at this and like and told me, Melody, it's busier than a NASA astronaut schedule. <laughs> and I told that to Aidan. He said, yeah, but we have only one shot. And Aidan was amazing. So even... On the ISS, when things got more difficult, and, and it, it is, it's very hard just to try to stay in schedule where thing, while you're getting used to microgravity condition and you don't know exactly where everything is. He stayed up late every night over there trying to finish all of the activities. He barely slept while he was on the ISS because he knew it, it's more important. Um, and I think this is what we tried to to explain to, to the space agencies and also Axiom that unlike regular astronaut or um, let's call it um, government astronaut, this is important to us on a national level and we want Aiden to succeed and do as much as, as he can in space because we have only How one How time did he get to sleep? Um, Let's say that the official time, I mean, the astronaut finishing the day around 7.30 p.m. and starting daily briefing in the morning in 7.30 a.m. Some nights, Aitan had, I think, two or three hours of sleeps because he uses the extra time um, trying to, to make more things, to, to make more to observations on, on science activity, more educational activities. Um, this is what people I hope don't he took get. some time to go up into the cupola and at least just <laughs> look. Just so actually, moment. one of the experiments that we conducted on, on that mission is a following experiment of the MADEX um, experiment that had started in the Columbia mission, STS-107. And Aiden continued. We, we, are, we worked with the same um, researcher, Professor Yoav Yair from Reichman University, and basically, Aitan had to go to the cupola to take imagery and videos of thunderstorms, trying to capture TLEs, transmit luminous events. It's the uh, optical or electro-optical phenomena that you can see above thunderstorms. It's between the, the clouds and the unisphere. It's, it's amazing. And I'm happy to share that after AX1, we continue to work with Axiom on that specific experiment because it's so easy to implement in a mission. You don't need to send any equipment because on the ISS you already have cameras. So we successfully trained the axiom of AX2 and AX3 to continue this experiment and we continue to get more results and more scientific data and we are still collaborating on, on this specific experiment. So Aiton got to spend a lot of time in the cupola in the excuse of science, basically. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Yeah. I'd like to volunteer to go <laughs> take more pictures mm. of the top of storms. Yeah. <laughs> I won't sleep. Oh. I'll stay up. I'll, I'll do the whole thing. <laughs> you say that now. It's hard. I mean, I, I'll, this is, this I'll, is... I'll, let, me, let me go find out. <laughs> <laughs> this is the thing. You, you hear this stuff and you hear like what the schedule was and what the training was and and then there are these people who like just dismissively say, "Ah, oh, it's just yeah, space tourism." This isn't space tourism. This is a this is like the most intense job and job training that I've ever heard of. It's it's wild. So yeah, take that anybody who who is still thinking that this is a form of tourism. 
No. I, I think people who think that just don't really understand the entire concept of that mission um, and what those astronauts try to do. And if you look at Axiom right now, so since AX1, more countries want or understanding that the best option to send astronauts to space is through Axiom. Usually when you go through the process with the formal space agency that build the, the ISS, like NASA or ESA, I don't know, ESA issued a call for proposal for astronaut once every 12 years. So your um, chances of, of getting choose to be an ESA astronaut is, is very limp. And then when after the astronaut will complete the two years training the chances to go to space are also it's like in four years and when they're going to be in space i mean they will conduct science and educational activity but they will also in charge of just maintenance of the iss versus if you go with with axiom i think 80 percent of your time you get to spend on science dedicated for your country, education dedicated for your country. And because of AX mission being so versatile with involving so many countries, you can also create collaboration between countries. So for example, Aiton, when he went on AX1, one of the astronauts was Mark Patty from Canada. So we immediately co collaborated. We had collaboration on the scientific and technological level between universities in Israel and Canada. We did educational activity where kids from Canada got to speak with kids from Israel and talk about space. And then they talked together with the astronauts while the astronauts were in space. They were talking simultaneously with Canadian kids and Israeli kids. So this gives you a really, I don't know, good opportunity that you don't get anywhere else. Um, AX3 mission was involved in European countries, so I'm sure I'm not I'm, I don't really know about all of the activities or educational activity that happened during that mission, but I'm sure Sweden um, kids were talking with Italian kids and and everyone was getting collaboration and opportunity. I don't know to work together in space, and this is what we want to see in space: how the entire world is being or coming together. Um, my, yeah. One of my favorite quotes of Ilan Ramon, the Israeli astronaut, is, and, and a lot of astronauts are saying that as well, that from space, you, you can see no borders. Um, right. They have the bigger, yeah. the overview effect. It's hard. Exactly. Yeah. I love that. I really do. And um, between the Axiom missions and also this new uh, fellowship that you got recently, the Carmen project, right? Like that's also a, a, a huge tenant of uh, their organization that they're looking to create um, kind of global uh, cooperative collaborations, um, which is, again, this other thing that you somehow have found the time to do. <laughs> it's incredible. I'm so privileged uh. in getting into this fellowship program. It's I still cannot believe that. Um, so the, the Carmen uh, pro Project is a nonprofit organization that every year they select uh, 15 individuals from the from around the world that had I don't know the the potential to lead their countries into a better space ecosystem and future. And I was really lucky enough to be chosen this year. It's it, I still cannot believe it. Um, and the fellowship is one year long, where they they give us. I see it as they give us a moment just to think of how we want to affect the world and create a better impact. Um, they give us some, I don't know, training on leadership skills and, and how to look a bit differently on society. I think one of why I'm, I'm so related to that is Ethan is coming from the impact world. So immediately after AX1, we measure the impact of the mission. And this is what led us to, to establish Israel Space Forum and the new formation of Rakia, which is another new uh, nonprofit organization in Israel. And this is going hand in hand with the Kalman Fellowship, where we're always thinking about what impact we want to create and how we can use space missions to increase the better impact of the world. Um, one of my dreams, and I don't know if we can say it especially now, but for the last two years, I'm constantly thinking of how I can achieve that. But I want to create human spaceflight mission of 
Arab countries astronaut and Israeli astronaut, trying to bring some peace to the corner of the planet where I live. Um, and I really hope that, the Car- that through the Carmen uh, Fellowship, I'll get opportunity to develop that idea, even if it will not be a full human spaceflight mission at the moment. Maybe we can organize a project together with Arab countries, building a satellite together, or if I'm going even smaller, just a conference, space conference mm-hmm. together with bringing, I don't know, people from all the Middle East trying to to talk space. This is why yep. I started to learn Arabic recently. So I'm, tr- I'm practicing my Arabic. So when I'll get the opportunity, I'll be able to speak fluently with other space enthusiasts from other Arab countries. Let's see. I love it. I love it. It's so great. And I think that's a great, it's a great message for our audience to take away from this conversation as well. Um, the importance of, of using space as a way to bring people together, um, which I think was something that we saw as well in like the original Apollo days, like in a way the Apollo missions and the space race was kind of a race between uh, the former Soviet Union and the United States, but also to understand like the linking up of American and Soviet spaceships and then the ongoing collaboration since then. Right. Like the, the fact that the International Space Station is an international space mm-hmm. station, right? Right. Um, there so, was yeah. a space race. It was the United States versus the Soviet Union. But then when somebody finally landed on the moon, it was perceived as a human achievement. Mm-hmm. And then yep. Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong and Michael Collins, they went on a worldwide tour everybody wanted them to come visit they went to they went to the soviet union as you know friends they went to china they went all over africa they went all over europe they want everybody wanted to meet them everyone wanted their turn to give them a parade not just for them but just look these are people who went to the moon it didn't matter so much it mattered a little i guess but not, not entirely that they were american you could almost say that they did it for all mankind <laughs> I've heard that somewhere. <laughs> I've never heard that. <laughs> oh, gosh. Benjamin, I feel like you, you probably have some more questions that we haven't touched on. I, I might have been hogging Melody's attention. What, what, yeah, what have you got? A lot. The notes? <laughs> uh, well, I had a question from earlier when we we're talking about going to the ISS and everything to do these missions of science and art and everything. I was wondering, sadly, are there any plans for after the ISS is done? Where are you guys, or where's the vision for the future? Where can missions like this go other than just orbiting around in a capsule? Uh, For Israel or for the entire world? For anybody. (laughs) Does anybody have any idea? Once there's no more destination, that's our only destination. <laughs> no, no, no. So first of all, it's not ending yet. Okay, let, let's no. make... At the moment, there are two space stations orbiting uh, planets. Right. The international one and the Chinese one. So even after the ISS will be done, we still have the Chinese space station. And hopefully, I don't know, we talked about world peace. Maybe we can collaborate with China as well. But even if not... Um, America has great plans for LEO or low Earth orbit um, mm-hmm. space station. There are commercial companies like Axiom Space, like Vast, like um, Voyager, who are building the Star Lab, trying to build commercial space stations and make space more affordable to engage more people, that, to give more, more people the opportunity to go to space. Um, and hopefully, at least one of them will be launching next year. I mean, Vast are not waiting for the Starship to to be completed. They are going to launch their module with the Falcon 9. So that's feasible to be launched next year even. So you'll have another space station. And then, of course, um, NASA big plan, um, Moon to Mars, or the Artemis mm-hmm. program, trying to go back to the moon. Um, I think it will take a bit longer than than we hope. But how exciting is that? To go back to the moon, NASA is going to build the gateway. Um, It's the station that's going to orbit the moon. I want to go to the moon, I have to say. 
Oh, heck <laughs> They should have called it a Stargate. Yeah. That would have been oh. perfect. A gateway to that the stars. Was... Chef's kiss on that one. That was <laughs> sweet. <laughs> oh man! Also, a shout out uh, to our to our friend Daron who who works at Vast. Um, we're, we're waiting. Clock's ticking, mate. Uh, you know, get that space station up there. <laughs> I I had a meeting with Vast people in in DC um, last week, and they gave me a virtual tour in their facility in Long Beach, and I was texting Daron. Doron, come and say hi to the camera because it was a live tour. Basically, they they showed me all around the facility and it was crazy. I'm like, where is Doron? And then he texted me, no, I'm at home. <laughs> what? For, for, for our audience and also for you, uh, Benjamin, for reference. So Doron is uh, a friend of ours who we was also a, a, a mentor in the Ramon Foundation Space Lab program. And, and now he's like literally just a, a space engineer it's not rocket science but it kind of is uh working for working for fast um but yeah wow that's so cool so so cool man i love space yeah. <laughs> all right so I, so glad. I, have, Toby, I have a confession so we, we mentioned uh for all mankind this is a tv series that we used to yep. gather once a week to watch it, usually in Kofi's apartment, just to watch an episode or two episodes once a week. And they both left Israel after the second season. Now, I think they're going to publish the fifth season, but I'm still stuck, stuck on season two because I cannot watch it without you. And every time I meet in Gareth Wiesman, he's the, Gareth Wiesman, the astronaut, he's the scientific advisor for this um TV series. He's asking me what is my opinion, and I'm so embarrassed to tell him I didn't watch because I need my buddies to watch the TV series. Uh, if it makes you feel any better, I haven't gone ahead and watched it without you guys either. Um, so we can definitely uh, catch oh, up on that. On spoil it for you. <laughs> <laughs> it gets pretty gosh darn good. Ah, uh, no spoilers. Uh, what? Amazing. I'm just saying. And also to the listeners, if you're listening, don't send in spoilers, please. Yeah, please don't. Definitely don't tell them about the clowns that come from Mars. <laughs> that part really creeped me out. I want them to experience <laughs> that. <laughs> yeah, really bringing the fi to sci-fi. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sure. Uh, all right, Benjamin, any last final questions before we, we let Melody go? I know that... Uh, probably a, a bit stressed on time uh, i'm fine on time but i don't have any more questions this is a fantastic uh, conversation thank you for joining oh, us great thank guys you. it was great i had a lot of fun here yes. so did we well i did look at Kari. i don't know oh absolutely my, <laughs> I, me, my, so. my jaw yeah my, my face is hurting here from smiling um <laughs> yeah this is this has been really fun um and i'm sure that we could talk for another hour or three or 10. Um, but thank you so much, Melody, for, for joining us and, and sharing your incredible journey to, to get to this even more incredible place that you're in now. And um, I mean, I guess we don't know when the next Israeli astronaut will be going to space, but I think we might have an idea of who she might be. So sorry. <laughs> be All awesome. right. Um, <laughs> Melody, it will, it will be, not might be, it will be. Um, Melody, if folks want to to connect with you um, or find you online, where where is the best place for them to do that? Oh gosh, I'm really terrible with social medias. I always forget to like check them, but I think the <laughs> best way is LinkedIn. Uh, you can find me as Melody S. Corman, or better, just Israel Space Phone. I, I check that more regularly than my personal account. All right. Done. Love it. How about Little you, Kavi? Where are you? Me? Yeah, I'm also checking social media less and less at the moment. Things are getting a bit busy, but you can find me and my shenanigans at Fun Fact Science on all the good social media platforms and the bad ones as well. 
Benjamin, where where can uh, people find you and where can they find uh, more content and episodes of this show? You can find me on all the social media things under the He's name so of better Science, than us. actually. Oh. He's much better than us. <laughs> yeah, well, I have more free time. Uh, Science Actually on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and Threads and Blue Sky and Mastodon and LinkedIn and blah, 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 blah. And All the places. Uh, please feel free to find our episodes for this show on TikTok and YouTube if you want to watch us. Or you can find us uh, wherever you get your podcasts. And please go to scienceactually.com slash podcast. And you can find the entire list of our episodes. And if you want, there's a way for you to get in touch with us. Give us your notes. Give us your questions. Tell us things. We'll try to write back to you. I think that's it. I think that's it. That's wonderful. Um, Thank you, Benjamin. Thank you, Melody, again for being here. And thank you to all of our listeners and watchers. Um, We will see you next time. uh, Or you will see us and hear us next time. Science Actually presents The Nerd and the Scientist.